Mick Cronin's biggest 2025 target is coming to campus this week. It's time to seal the deal. You are locked on UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free wherever it's your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for your support. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. All you got to do is go to Game Time, create an account, download the app, use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. And where we get started today is a potential future star to UCLA. Mick Cronin went extremely ham, as the youngins say. He went all in on international freshmen, and a lot of freshmen in the season previous to this one. It did not pan out. The international route has not gone so well for Mick Cronin. And then this last year, Cronin had a very early commit from his only high school signee early in 23 for the 24 cycle. Then next thing you know, six transfers later, an, a late steal of McDonald's All-American. You fix in one of the transfers with an NIL scholarship deal of sorts. And then McCronin has a full roster with many of those players having multiple years of eligibility heading into 25. So what is McCronin looking for? He's looking for that 6'6", 6'7", 6'8", guy who can handle the ball. He can play wing. He can pr- probably play small ball four. And not sure where this goes, but Nick Kaminia has been a top target for UCLA now, right? I talked about Tunde Yesufu. He's a guy that's off the board. Took UCLA off. He eventually committed to Baylor. Very shocking there. You have plenty of other UCLA offers and prospects who have slowly taken their names out of the running or UCLA's name out of the running for their potential commitment. And we know Cronin, when he has a lot of talent available, when he's got the NIL backing to go get guys in the portal now, he will be extremely stingy, very picky with who he wants. And Nick Kaminia fits a position of need. Kobe Johnson, Lazar Stefanovic, both in their final years of eligibility. So this is a kid out of Harvard-Westlake. UCLA just swung and had a massive home run with Trent Perry late in the signing cycle because USC got rid of, or, you know, he, they didn't get rid of, but Andy Enfield left, went to SMU. Perry opened his commitment, goes to UCLA. Apparently, he's a great fit, and it could actually fight for starting minutes or a big spot for this year's team. Now, Kaminia fits a need for UCLA. He's been flirting. He's got five other schools go, he's been checking out, but UCLA is supposed to have Kaminia on campus this week, right? You have it in October because, one, classes don't get started so early for UCLA on a quarter system. Two, he's also going on a West Coast swing to go up to Gonzaga afterwards, right? I think they have the craziness at the kennel. He's been there a couple of times. Mark Few and Kaminia have been, maybe not in cahoots, but he's been linked to Kaminia for a while. UCLA offered this kid back, I believe, in early 23. So my thing is, for somebody who's already visited Gonzaga a couple of times, has it committed, and you know how big Gonzaga is, right? They're now a Pac-12 school. And if this kid's going to stay around for two years, he'll be playing technical Pac-12 basketball or get the glitz, the glamour, the NAL funding, which I'm not sure would be too different between Gonzaga basketball and UCLA basketball, right? Small private school up north in the Pacific Northwest versus UCLA's now boosted NIL, which should have some openings and potential offerings for an incoming freshman. This is UCLA's target, right? I'm looking at the 24-7 sports list, and the other list they got has Braden Burries, five-star. It seems like it's cool, and I'm not sure UCLA is going to go after Burries. Maybe they could get both. They swung two freshmen in the last class, one of which was literally out of nowhere when they had no scholarship spots remaining, and they worked it. The Bruins, you know, with the increase in scholarships coming in the NCAA, they can handle it when the men's basketball scholarships go from 13 to 15. So there's a lot of good things about Kaminia. Let's talk about some of his build, right? I even was texting with some Locked On Zags host, Andy Patton, who hosts Locked On College Basketball. And he's like, yeah, the, the Zags have had him up a couple of times. And so far, they haven't been able to seal the deal. You got to think Mark Few picks who he wants and Mick Cronin picks who he wants. And this is the guy UCLA's been going after. It's in his own backyard. He's been scouting Perry. He knows what Harvard-Westlake looks like, right? You see the Sierra Canyons. You see all these guys 
in that northern L.A. plaza of sorts when it comes to those private schools, the glitz and the glamour, the Hollywood kids. And UCLA has been picking their, not poison, but picking their picks, getting to McDonald's All-American. So Kaminia, he's a top 20 kid in the country. The body and build of a player that UCLA is looking to fill, and they still might go to the portal to get another, so they're not shorthanded. Even though almost all of these players, more than half, have more eligibility, that's why you bring in a young gun who probably McCorn has to tell, hey, I'm not sure you're going to get playing time year one. You might. You fit a spot of need. But I've got guys who can shift up and down. If you can't play defense, no, this is not the spot for you. So Cronin checks the makeup. He checks the funding. And, of course, hey, is this style of basketball good enough? Well, let's talk about Kaminia. This is what it says on the 24-7 sports site from Adam Finkelstein. He's a terrific overlap of size, skill, and a very high basketball IQ. Great instincts and a natural feel for the game. Exceptional passer who can throw darts off the dribble with both hands, thread the needle when needed, and knows how to be a ball mover as well. So then the other thing that's also talked about acclimates to offensive structure. Cronin isn't always known for the most structured offenses, ball to ball, right? And the big thing is he's a passer. If you got a pass first guy who can play some defense, long, lanky dude, that's who UCLA can go get. And it looks like UCLA might be able to get him. This is like their only guy they're going after. So you swing and miss. Then I'm not sure where UCLA pivots. Are they going to go get a five-star who ranks higher after you swing and miss on a kid in your own backyard? I'm not so sure. 6'8", 215 power, pound for, power forward from Studio City. All right. The other thing that is, na- that is talked about for Kaminia lacks great strength and natural quickness. Maybe not the quickest of bodies, right? Not a Kobe Johnson, but he is at his strength and he's athletic enough to be a lab threat. Doesn't have sheer explosiveness, but has the intellect, can communicate on the floor, and you hope he can turn into a, a point forward type role, right? And that's not exactly what Kobe Johnson and Stefanovic are, but he fits the body type, and Cornyn might use him as needed. Dylan Andrews still has another year of eligibility after that. Or he's got plenty of guys who can play point guard. This is that guy that can play the three and the four, handle the ball, hopefully shoot quite a bit, and has, an, this is what Finkelstein says, a natural feel for the game. And he's coming to UCLA. This is the week to seal the deal. Look at all those 25s, right? Signing day, which may no longer be a thing for in the future after this year or in the spring next year. But that's what they keep saying about daylight savings time. So who knows what that means? To sign the NLI, National Letter of Intent, which eventually means what you're signing for your NIL, name, image, likeness deal of sorts. This is a guy in UCLA's backyard that they're linked. They have a lean. I believe I've read something. They might be in a crystal ball. I forget exactly, but I I don't have those inside sources. But if he hasn't committed to Gonzaga yet, he does have a couple other schools in his top five, and he's coming to UCLA in October. That day's looming. Expect this kid to commit pretty soon. He hasn't posted anything from what I've seen. He hasn't been teasing. But all these guys are going off the board where UCLA was in on it, maybe Cronin backed out. Maybe those guys got much fatter deals. Maybe the fit wasn't right. They wanted to get away from LA. They wanted to get away from Southern California. They wanted to go somewhere else. Cool. That's why there's so many different options in your recruit. You put in the efforts. But to me, it's funky that he's been to Gonzaga so many times and hasn't committed. Now, you bring in what he could fit for UCLA, what they're missing. Maybe a Stefanovic, a little taller, a little stronger more of a ball handling type role point forward. That's that guy who can fit in a role, whether it's a starter or a backup in this next iteration for UCLA in a year from now, with still a lot of this transfer talent and freshman talent there to pick up the slack for whoever leaves to go pro transfers out or just ends their collegiate career. UCLA, I think needs Kamenia because they've got nobody else. I think in the works, other guys are looking elsewhere, pull themselves out of the running. But I think the Bruins are looking good for what is their big recruit here in 25. And what a year to sit there and watch this Bruin team grow with what is supposed to be one of the better teams, Mick Cronin. Maybe the best team, the best team Cronin has had in his tenure at UCLA. I'm excited. Speaking of excited for this year's team, the unofficial Big Ten preseason media poll came out. Where the Bruins slot? It wasn't number one. Let's talk about it next on Locked on UCLA. You're probably going to go want to watch these Bruins play this year. Where do you go? Go to Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Use the code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. And hey, Game Time. You can get the all-in pricing. It's toggled on. You got to make sure you toggle that feature on 
So you have no surprise fees at checkouts, right? I think everybody's getting the memo. We don't like surprise fees. Know what you're paying up front. Toggle this feature in game time. And you can get a lowest price guarantee with game time. Check it out or game time will credit you 110% of the difference when you're comparing prices. Go check it out. If you're looking for those low near tip off game time prices, that's where you got to go. Game time. It's the place to go to get your Bruin tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create the account. Terms apply. Use the code Locked On College. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. All right, now we take that breath. Excited for Kaminia. He's that guy that UCLA is looking for. It's, it's the week. Maybe he commits at the end of the week. Who knows? I'm not saying that. I think maybe UCLA has a good chance, and this is the week to seal the deal. Now, speaking of the week to talk about this team, they have come out with the all-preseason team of the Big Ten. The conference led it. They've already come out with the official Big Ten preseason poll for the women. UCLA picked to finish second. Now, UCLA on the men's side, they are a force to be reckoned with, right? This is, I think, a combined effort. I forget which two publications it is, but it is on the Indy Star, at least for one of them. Because remember, Cleveland.com did do the football one. I think Indy Star com combined. They got a, I think maybe it was a Columbus Dispatch in the Indy, Indy Star. They had an unofficial media poll with at least 33 to 36 different pundits talking about what that we expect to go in this Big Ten, right? UCLA preseason wise, especially from the Midwest. The doubt that the football team has is the complete opposite in optimism when it comes to basketball. UCLA guarded a couple of first place votes. There were a total of six different teams that got first place votes in this Big Ten. Purdue, Indiana, UCLA, Illinois, Michigan State, and Ohio State. And for large part, some of those would be finishing in that order. So Purdue picked to finish first, 20 first place votes. That's without Edie. But the preseason player of the year, Braden Smith, their point guard, he's supposed to be a floor general. Then you've got Indiana. Mike Woodson hit the portal. He got Umar Balo. That's supposed to be a big man in the post for an Indiana team that's trying to make that next step under Mike Woodson. Then you got UCLA slot in there. All right? So I'm not exactly sure at this very moment what Purdue's got beyond the point guard. And I remember last year, Purdue, the reason why they went so far was not because Zach Eady was a baller. It's because they filled in the depth around him. And while I don't have the names, I got to do a little more homework. So don't get mad at me, Boilermaker fans or the La or you know Big Ten fans. But I remember when I was watching Purdue, it was because their guards were much better than the year before when they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson in the first round, 16-1 upsets. And then they make the national championship game where they lost to a UConn team who probably would have boat raced many teams in that national championship game. And they've done it for two straight tournaments in a row. So there's no fault in Gonzaga, or excuse me, in UConn and Purdue. You know, there's no fault for the Boilermakers. Edie was a baller, and I do wonder what that size looks like on the interior, considering UCLA, they do have their 7 3 guy in Adai Mata, but he's not maybe that first or second option off the bench right now. As much as the coaching staff keeps talking about, look at the strength and how strong Mata has been, despite him sitting out early portions of fall workouts, late summer workouts with a foot injury. If UCLA needs to have a seven-footer, Kyle's going to man that five spot, right? William Kyle the third, he just may be a little undersized. So if Purdue brings out number seven, another seven-two guy, that can be tough. Indiana, they've got the big men. It's familiar faces. So the one thing for Mick Cronin UCLA has when they go to Assembly Hall, they're scouting at least a couple of those important new pieces for Indiana. Guys they've already played or they've played many times. Maybe not this team, but what the coaching staff has seen. So it's not something new when it's a post player. Illinois, they don't got Terrence Shannon Jr. Michigan State, the perennial team, top dog amongst the top of the Big Ten, always overhyped. They always play some team, right, whether it's on a battleship or some weird game elsewhere like Kentucky, wherever, and they might beat them, and then they're top ten, they lose ten to games, right? It's been a perpetual, is Tom Izzo done? Is he ready? That's a team you don't want to face in any meaningful game. UCLA had to beat them in overtime, have a crazy comeback the year they made it to the Final Four. And then you look at Oregon, Rutgers. Rutgers is supposed to be pretty entertaining right now, right? They're supposed to be very good. Wow, State new coach, Michigan new coach. Maryland just beat UCLA last year at Poly. They got revenge. Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, USC picked to finish 14th. 
Washington, Northwestern, Penn State, Minnesota. And Northwestern just went to a couple of tournaments, but that was with Boo Booey. All right? With Boo Booey. And who knows what this Big Ten, 18 teams. This isn't like football where you're only playing nine of the 18 or the 17 prospective proponents. UCLA has to go to somebody's house and some of these teams come to UCLA, right? That seems fair, all right? You play everybody once and a couple of teams locally twice. And that's where I think UCLA playing the Oregons and the USC's and the Washington's. USC, although I have a lot of confidence in Eric Musselman, picked to finish in the bottom with Washington. You get home and homes in those games, and you go 5-1 and one with your regional local select games that they have, right? Each team has three opponents. They play home and home. The rest, they go one place. The other come to UCLA. That's where I think UCLA could win a Big Ten regular season title, get that one seed in the Big Ten tournament in Indianapolis. But as Mick Cronin says, our fans don't care about the Big Ten regular season title. Well, I do. It's fun. But as he mentioned, his goal is to raise the 12th banner, right? Whether it's the Big Ten regular season, the Big Ten tournament, I think UCLA is a wrecking ball preparing to get to a third weekend in the NCAA tournament this year. Not to say that they're going to handle themselves in Purdue, right? UCLA has to go to in the states of Indiana, Illinois, twice in a row, and then the Big Ten tournaments in Indiana. The back half of the schedule with a lot of talent, they get Indiana, Illinois. Those were the teams picked to finish second and fourth in the conference. UCLA has to go there. Then they got to go to Purdue. So three of these games that UCLA is picked to finish in between or behind right now, UCLA has to go on the road to all those games, right? That is what the Bruins have to do in this year's schedule as I go look at it real quick one more time. It, this is the only thing that could hurt UCLA from really challenging for a top spot in the Big Ten this year is because they have a brutal December schedule. They start at Nebraska. They get an early Maryland Rutgers trip. The travel could really hurt this UCLA team. Although, as I've discussed before, from mid-January until early February, the Bruins don't leave the West Coast, and their only trip is to Washington. Then they do get the Illinois-Indiana trips around Valentine's Day weekend. They play at Purdue and Northwestern. Evanston, that's a tough place to play after Purdue on a Friday night at the end of February. So my thing is, those tough teams atop the conference, near the top, UCLA has to go there. The preseason, you know, preseason selected elite in this Big Ten. So I wonder how it's going to be, kind of getting an idea. I do think they're overlooking the Bruins. I think teams are like, hey, UCLA is going to, they're just throwing UCLA up there because they know they're not going to be bad. The transfer numbers are good. But I think the UCLA Bruins are still being slept on from the 24th best team in the country to what I think will be a Final Four contender. Now, maybe both people, you know, the national pundits and myself can be right. How? UCLA has a stretch in the end of December, middle December, where they play at Oregon, a team that's supposed to be close to them in the conference. They got to play Arizona in the state of Arizona. North Carolina in New York, and then Gonzaga in a neutral site in Inglewood at the new Clippers Stadium, the Intuit Dome, and start Big Ten play on the road after the New Year's in Nebraska. So I think maybe it might come down to an accumulation of losses because I think the Bruins will have a lot more than we want this year just because the schedule is so tough, but Cronin will take them far in the tournament with this talent as long as they gel. I'm very confident Cronin has learned from the mistakes of last year. They're veteran players. He's handpicked these guys who have filled all the weaknesses that UCLA had pretty much from last year, limited weaknesses. And even though he is, McCronin has said he is a little afraid about what the center spot might bring. I think the Bruins have depth and versatility to overcome that and beat teams in one game scenarios. And they play such great defense, generally under a McCronin coach team, that they can account for any weakness. All right. Third, that's not disrespect, but I do think, hey, I, I think they can win this. The only reason why they can't, they don't get a home and home. They go to Purdue, they go to Purdue, to Indiana, to Illinois. And I think that will add up by the time the Big Ten tournament comes. And maybe UCLA seed is going to be where Joe Lenardi puts him, right? Six seed, five seed. I think it's that's the disrespectful part, unless what he's accounting for is this UCLA team is much better. They just might have a lot more losses than is liked by a committee that wants to give them a one or two seat. But generally, the Big Ten is 
filled with NCAA tournament participants every single year. Every single year. The big joke and the big knock is that they just get knocked out early in the tournament. But it's very tough. I don't think that's a UCLA team this year. All right. This year, though, UCLA is having a little problem like quarterback heading into the Penn State game. What does Ethan Garbers look like heading into the Penn State game? Let's talk about that next on Locked on UCLA. Hey, NFL fans, uh, you can start the season big on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and if so, so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Again, that's $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet on FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. I know it's a big spread for the UCLA Penn State game. Do you want to get ahead of it? As we talk about in the next segment, is UCLA's quarterback Ethan Garbers going to play? Well, in my mind, I think the Bruins do cover if Garbers plays a full, complete game. If he doesn't, you might want to take the Penn State side of things. I don't want to say it, but that's the likelihood at this moment with the dire situation UCLA has at quarterback. Take that info as you want and go to FanDuel.com. Once again, FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Cruising on, last segment of the Locked On UCLA podcast. So far, practice reports out of Spalding Field on the campus of UCLA out in Westwood. It's not looking good for Ethan Garbers. Three straight days early in the week, the depth chart had Ethan Garbers as number one. Well, he's not being supplanted, but he might be replaced for a week if he's not healthy enough. I remember I had a talk with Zach Seiko. We're going to have that as our next episode, a Locked On UCLA, Locked On Nittany Lions crossover where – if UCLA doesn't have Garbers for a full game, you're going to bring in Justin Martin. Or the idea is the Bruins have played the second toughest schedule in the country. Do you give Martin some run, keep Garbers out, and then against a string of winnable games in the back half of the schedule, do you want your QB1 to be healthy? That's maybe not the mindset you necessarily want, or maybe that is what you want. Protect Garbers from himself because he couldn't stay healthy last year. And the offensive line is not health is not good enough this year, quite frankly, to keep him upright. The running game is not good enough. Without the scramble ability of Garbers, we've seen inconsistency to go out there and put your starting quarterback who's hobbled. He's getting hit again and again, and this is his opportunity. So he's wanna he wants to be out there. He's missed three straight practices, and he already had limited mobility against Oregon. And that's a team that is strong up front defensively. Penn State coming off one of their strongest performances up front against Illinois. And they've made Luke Olmeyer struggle. They, they dominated the line of scrimmage. And it's expected for that to be the same on Saturday. And Saturday morning here in the big noon kickoff game. But maybe you trot out Justin Martin. You give him an opportunity when the lights are shining brightest on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning in Los Angeles. A more athletic quarterback who I'm not sure has really solved his happy feats. But if he can get there, settle in, that's a big opportunity to see does UCLA have a future starting quarterback when Garbers leaves and graduates after this year? I wonder, do you give that an opportunity? But I do think it will be an ugly game if the Bruins have to go with an option other than Garbers. And I know there's not a lot of love for Garbers, but he is a guy that has been the unquestioned starter, had to fight to get his job, wait to get his job, fight through injury in a poor offense. Imagine, remember in 22 when Garbers, and in 21 when Garbers came in twice in situations when the game was late and you had a top-tier Oregon team. He came in the bowl game after DTR got hurt. With a better offensive line, with the game on the line, he was leading the team down the field. He threw the pick against Oregon, but okay, he was a youngster then. Against, you know, Pitt, in the Sun Bowl in early 23 with a better offensive line, he went down the field and scored a touchdown. It's just because UCLA's defense couldn't get a stop with like 30 seconds left. We've seen what Garbers looked like with a simple offense and a much better offensive line. He's led UCLA down the stretch to score a touchdown with uh, some of these pieces here intact. And the problem is, yes, he's the best quarterback on this team. There is nothing that can change my mind unless – Martin goes out, who is the supposed second team court, second on the depth chart, and plays the game of his life. And even then, 
I'm not sure that it's better than what Garbers can bring on his best day fully healthy, but he has a different set of skills that Garbers does not have. And it's not looking promising when the QB taking the one reps in a complicated offense all week long, trying to put in your sets, putting your schemes against Penn State, which is pretty strong defensively, although they do give up a lot of points to Bowling Green earlier, that it's not looking likely and promising for Garbers to play. Three straight days, it's a Thursday, that's usually a lighter day, then a travel day, that's not going to be good. I'm assuming he'll travel. I don't know that personally at this moment. I don't know personally if he'll play, but Deshaun Foster has been mum, right? He has come out already and said he's not going to discuss injuries. He's only going to put out the, pra- the, the injury report prior to the game of the Big Ten mandates. And the way it's looking like UCLA might be leaning or using Martin and they have to, and they're just not going to come out and say it. They're not going to be like Michigan when they played USC and said, hey, we're going with Alex Orgy because their quarterback situation is in flux, and all we're going to do is run the ball, and they still won. right? They've won the last two weeks with that situation. UCLA doesn't want to really give away and reveal their cards. And all right, Deshaun's playing it, probably playing us. You know, the te- people who cover the team, the media, everybody, the fans, doesn't want to give that to Penn State. But now that's like, hey, he's on a bike three straight days. It's kind of telling whether it's a Monday night practice. Tuesday. Practice times aren't exactly the same time every week or every day of the week. They're the late night Mondays, the Tuesday mornings, afternoon. So that's different types of the day, whether it's warmer, whether it's cooler in L.A., that maybe he hasn't been loose enough to get out and practice. And there's a clear difference. I just wonder and hope that if Martin's athleticism comes in, he can throw a good ball and the Bruins can generate a run game, that it won't be too embarrassing against Penn State Saturday morning. Or you might see a gutsy effort from Garbers to go start, but we've seen this before where he's a little banged up and he doesn't finish the game. And that's no problem on him, but when you're hit again and again, he just has to get taken out because he can't walk on the field. can't walk up and down with the chain game. And that will be a little tough because Garbers is the best passer, the vocal leader, the veteran presence on this team. And yes, Martin's been there quite a few years, put up big high school numbers. But, you know, it is a telling sign three days in that they might be leaning with a different option going into Penn State. And it might not end up well for the Bruins. I hope it doesn't. But I do hope everybody who gets their opportunity, who misses their opportunity, plays well, rehabs and gets healthy, and the Bruins come out and shock the world against Penn State. All right? Because that's a big line, and I'm thinking UCLA can cover with Garbers playing a full game. And maybe Martin can show out, hey, I've got tools. I can play well for a little bit against one of the best defenses in the country in the Big Ten. Because Penn State stops the run. So it's going to need a good quarterbacking day for UCLA to stay close for a large portion of the game. All right? In Happy Valley, the stripe out game. We'll find out more as the week progresses. And until then, we're going to hands up, Bruins fans, get Nate Clapp. Next episode, I have another crossover with Zach Seiko of Locked on Nittany Lions. Get excited. Have fun. Like, comment, subscribe. Watch that next episode. Like this episode. Comment what you think. Hands up, Bruins fans. It clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You. See. L.A. You see L.A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been Locked on UCLA. Zach signing off. Go Bruins.